and we're a go. All right. So is there any, I know you obviously haven't had a chance to listen to the neuro and musculoskeletal, but is there anything I can clarify that we talked about last week before we play Jeopardy? Anything you want to rediscuss, clarify, any concerns you have? All right, since I haven't heard anything, and by all means, at any time, please chime in with that chat function. You know, sometimes I get a little carried away, <laughs> so if I don't see your, your chat response right away, I promise I will make sure I see it, um, and if by some chance I miss it, let me know, um, but I, I will try and keep up with that, but um, feel free to... to um, to chime in at any time with questions, responses, whatever you want. I want this to be, I know it's a little unusual to be doing this virtually, but I want it to be as close to as if we were face-to-face -face as it can be. Um, so I will, I'm going to pull the Jeopardy up and I'm going to make it to where you can see my screen. Um, and then we will go through the questions. I know it's a little weird um, as far as having you pick categories and, and the question numbers with it being virtual. So I will just go through kind of an order and go through them. Um, but I do want y'all to respond via the chat function with me. All righty. Let's see how this is going to go. All right. So let's see. All right, so I want to make sure that you see what I see. What I've done here is I've shared my screen with you, basically what's showing what I see. Um, so what you should kind of see in the middle is five of y'all's names listed and then mine kind of over in the corner. Is that what y'all see? I was trying to pull up my phone so I could be on as a student to compare, and it was acting funky. So, okay, so um, once I pull up the PowerPoint, you'll be able to see that that will be most of your screen. Um, if you are on a phone by chance, it may be hard because I know the screen is small. When I was playing with it last night, the screen was kind of small and it was kind of hard for me to see. So if you are on a phone and it's hard for you to see, you can just kind of listen for now um, to get that part. And again, it'll be recorded. So if you want to pull it up later on a laptop or something, um, you're welcome to do that so you can read it a little bit better. And don't forget, even though we're not having classes, campus is open as far as the computer lab. So if you ha don't have access at home, to internet or, or a laptop or computer or whatnot, you can still come to campus and use printing and um, the computer lab capability. So I want to make sure y'all are aware of that. All right, let's do round one. All righty. Now, I just realized with me having this pulled up like this, it turns off my chat function on the side. Um, so I'll go back to it um, every couple questions just to see if you have anything posted. So if I don't answer you right away, don't think that I'm ignoring you. I just don't see it yet. Uh, I'm learning how to use this process here. All right, so let's do our first one. Our first category we'll cover is pediatric hospitalization. So, um, guilty feelings associated with illness, such as thinking that bad behavior was a cause for hospitalization. Who, what developmental group do we usually see this in? So, I'll give you a second to think about it, um, to answer, and then I'll let you know. So, when we were talking about last week, about how um, instead of understanding that strep, for instance, might be caused by germs, um, strep may be caused by, um, in their head, that they punch their brother or whatnot. So the group that you'll see this in, preschooler, most common, you might start seeing a little bit of this in the older toddler population, um, but preschooler is going to be um, the big one that you see. Mm, I'm trying to, there we go, there we go. So that, I just figured out how to switch back and forth. So again, bear with me. I'm working on this. Um, if you want, 
So what I can do that way, it's not so jumbled up, especially if you're re-watching this um, with the recording. What I will do is I will just basically go through the questions um, and give you the answers. I know that makes it a little odd, um, but um, we'll go through and I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you a second to read it yourself and think about it without just giving you the answer immediately, um, but that'll make it, and we'll get better at this as we do it a few times. Alrighty. All right, so that was our first question. Let's go to our second question. Um, so these are some things that should be included in documentation of a child when they are discharged. So something we talked about last week is um, when a child is discharged, and this is also children as well as an adult, so you can use this with either population. So things that you're going to want to document to make sure it's clear how that child looked when they left and who they left with. You want to know their condition, if they were alert and oriented, for instance, if they were ambulatory, um, their appearance, how they were. Um, you want to document discharge vitals, um, who the patient was released with and how they were released. So patient was discharged with mom, transported by wheelchair to personal vehicle, something like that. Um, you also want to document any teaching that was provided to the, to the parents or even the patient um, because that needs to be be a part of the chart so we know just like we do with documenting teaching when they're inpatient we want to know what teaching they got um, before they left sorry I didn't mean to hit that um, anyway next question these are measures that help the child with adjustment to hospitalization so there are some things that are going to vary a little bit from um, developmental group to developmental group, but some of the big ones um, that are with every group, orientation to the unit. So you know this just from even being an adult. When you're oriented to something that's going on or an environment, it makes it more comfortable and you're able to adjust better, um, as well as procedures, knowing what's happening. And lenient visiting hours as well as lenient visiting um, who can visit. And I know right now we're, we're in a state where visiting is very restricted. Um, but lenient visiting hours where um, you're not going to stick to like in the adult population where it, nobody can visit after say 8 p.m. and things like that um, and oftentimes they'll let usually they encourage at least one parent but sometimes they'll even let two parents stay overnight um, so um, that's a big help in helping them adjust I'm just gonna switch over see making sure none of you have questions and then we'll go back Alrighty, next question. In this stage of separation anxiety, the child appears more attached to staff than to parents. It's an ego defense mechanism that can cause psychosocial problems over the long term. Um, so we talked about three stages of separation anxiety last week. Um, the first couple stages are what we consider normal stages where they have the protest stage, and then um, they, where they are protesting and they're very upset. Um, and then it can progress to, if the parent is away for a long period of time, this detachment or denial phase. And this is where they appear um, to be adjusting to their environment. Um, but in all actuality, there is their coping mechanism to protect their feelings because they're being separated um, from their parents. So what stages experience separation anxiety? All of them. So separation anxiety starts at about six to nine months of age. So it starts with your infancy. This goes all the way up to adolescence. But what is different about adolescence? Adolescence, this is related to separation from their peers instead of separation from their parents. So up through school age, um, about middle school age, it's not that their peers that they have a problem with. It is their, their parents. Uh, um, and then in adolescence, they need those peer interactions. So encouraging peer interactions, they often get very upset um, when their, their, their friends don't call them or come to see them or things like that. The best therapeutic communication method to use when providing education to a child about a procedure. So when it comes to various different ages, you can have different things that can 
um, be effective methods for communication. We talked a little bit about some of those based on the developmental level, but when it comes down to it, every single age, and this goes for adults as well, you first need to figure out what they already know. So if they ask you what's going to happen about something, first thing you can say is what do you think's going to happen? Um, so you get where they're coming from where they're feeling, what they're, especially when you're talking about those toddlers and preschoolers where their imaginations run wild, um, you can get an idea of where they're coming from and then you can adjust your information to their developmental age based on what they already know or what they already think. Um, if they think that they need to have surgery because there are monsters in their throat, for instance, because they need their tonsils taken out. That's going to take a little, um, a little adjustment, for instance. All right, a good technique to assess a patient's feelings as well as use distraction in a school-aged child. So a technique we talked about that can be used um, for lots of different methods is drawing and art therapy. So um, once you get to adolescence, you'll see more journaling um, that's a better option, but drawing and art therapy are excellent ways of not just communication but distraction as well. But they allow us to, um, when they can't put into words how they're feeling or what they're fears are, they can draw a picture of it and we can better gauge those feelings through those drawings. All right, just going to check. See if y'all have any questions. No questions. All right, I will continue. All right. The best pain scale to use in a five-year-old patient. So you're going to need to know, um, I told you about three big pain scales that I want you to know. And I want you to know these three big pain scales um, as well as the ages that you would use them for. Like the ones like FLAC, for instance, I don't necessarily need you to analyze. This is the patient, so what would be their pain? Um, but knowing um, what the ages are for those pain scales and how we would use them. So in a five-year-old, we can use the Wong Baker Faces Scale or the Faces Scale. Um, this is the one where I had the picture of the Lego bricks for heads for you. And it, this is where you have them point to the picture that you feel the most like. Um, so this population um, that uses this pain scale starts at three years old. So if they're less than three years old, they cannot use the Faces Scale. If they're one year old, which is less than three, they would need the FLAC scale, which stands for face, legs, activity, cry, and consolability. This is um, a behavioral scale. So a one-year-old cannot put together a picture with their feelings, so we have to gauge their behavior in how they're feeling. And a 10-year-old and older child, they can use the adult numeric scale. Um, according to ATI, um, the adult numeric scale does start in a five-year-old. So really, the initial question um, could have been a faces scale or a numeric scale, but really in, in real life we would use more the faces scale in a five-year-old, but um, as far as for ATI purposes, five-year-old you could use either one. Um, obviously I wouldn't make it that specific where you'd have to pick and choose because they would both be correct answers, um, but make sure you know those ages in ATI of what, um, what your pain scales are. All right. So this coping mechanism occurs when patients revert back to previous behaviors. Y'all know this so well. Everybody always gets this question correct on my quizzes. Y'all know this one. This is your regression. Um, so we talked about regression. Regression is normal. Um, with regression, you have uh, where they have a reverting back to a previous behavior um, that's a coping mechanism. Again, it is an ego defense mechanism. Um, the, the one I used in class that I feel we see the most common in pediatrics is bedwetting. Very, very common in your early school age kids um, and even your preschoolers that are potty trained um, for them to revert back to bedwetting. Regression is normal as long as they go back to their normal behavior within two weeks after discharge and it is normal for these patients to um, to continue that when they go home so that's good anticipatory guidance for the parents to let them know that don't expect it to go away right away the best method to associate time with a toddler or preschooler so this age they are not going to understand five minutes 
they're not going to understand 5 p.m. So when you're talking about time with these younger children, um, you need to associate it with some kind of event that they understand. Like, for instance, it'll be breakfast time, dinner time, bedtime, bath time, whatever it is that they associate with a certain time of day. They understand that concept, so you can use those concepts to associate time events as opposed to actual specific units of time. Make sure I'm going to check. Ah, good job, Denise. You answered me regression. Perfect. Um, Y'all always know that one. All righty. This should never be done when administering a bitter medication to a child. So we should never mix medications really in anything um, is best. Um, so if we mix it in formula or breast milk, um, we lose that nutritive source if they develop an aversion to it because of the, the bitter tasting taste of the medication. If we mix it in juice, we run across the problem with if they don't drink the whole thing, we don't know how much medication they actually received, especially suspensions. If you've ever looked at liquid Motrin or Tylenol, if you don't shake it up, it's not equal. It's much thicker and heavier in the bottom. That's what a suspension is, where it's got thick, heavier particles in a liquid. So if you don't shake it up, it, it's not going to be equal. That's why you should always shake those up and if you look at juice even if you stir it it's going to start to settle so if they don't take the whole thing you don't know how much they received um, so really the only way you should mix medication in something is if you can put it in a amount of something that's very very small like for instance um, a little bit of honey if they're over the age of 12 months which you'll hear about that in your neuro lecture because I talk about rise syndrome um, if they are maybe a little bit of jam or jelly maybe a little bit of ice cream something like that but something that you can do a very small amount basically on the tip of a spoon just to kind of cover up that that flavoring a little bit all right priority education points to include when teaching parents about med administration in any group so this goes for adults as well as children one of the big things we teach everybody to take the entire course of the medicine especially with antibiotics that's a big focus um, and I'm guilty of it I will admit um, where you, you've taken you get 10 days of antibiotics and you've taken seven and you're feeling better so you get a little lazy on the last few days um, but this is how we create superbugs and, and super infections so um, this is take, making sure they take every dose um, whether they like it or not um, making sure those doses are also spread out appropriately if they are taking a medicine twice a day they can't take it at breakfast and lunch it needs to be like breakfast and dinner or breakfast and bedtime something that's um, relatively you know spread out as equally as possible and another important thing and really you can use this with adults as well if you're given liquid medicines or IV medicines using a precise measuring device if you tell a parent go take a teaspoon of Tylenol um, some people will just pull a teaspoon out of their their uh, silverware drawer and give that and that is not the same you need a, a measuring spoon or or a um, measuring cup or syringe or something that's with precision to make sure the correct dose is being administered all right so let's see what all these there's a lot of answers right here encouraging parent presence telling the child that they can yell or cry using distraction modeling the behavior all these are appropriate preparations for what developmental group um, so really there are two developmental groups this can fall in your toddlers as well as your preschoolers this works very well with now parent presence all the way up through school age that's a good thing to use um, like I mentioned in class you can tell them it's okay when I'm starting an IV on these patients I tell them you can yell and scream and cry all you want just don't move that arm um, using distraction trying to talk to them hey look at the TV a lot of places have TV where they'll they'll try and get them to focus on the TV modeling the behavior if I'm doing a strep test I'll say here open your mouth ah, and open my mouth to, to model that so these are a lot of things you can use to help with preparation for procedures in the toddler group as well as your preschool group I was gonna say we didn't go through all of them hold on I hit the wrong button let's see where we ended up 
There we go. I found it. So this is one of the most common opioids used in pediatrics due to the quick onset and short half-life. So I talked about in class there are only two opioids we really use in pediatrics. One of those is fentanyl. Um, fentanyl is a great drug because it has a quick onset, which makes it good for acute pain, but it's also good in pediatrics because it has a short half-life. So if the child is acting overdosed, for instance, um, and we're having to say give Narcan or they're very sleepy, um, it's gonna get out of their system faster. So even if, say, we're Narcaning them, Narcan typically doesn't last as long as your opioid. Um, oftentimes when patients need to get Narcan or naloxone, they have to get multiple doses until that opioid wears off. The beauty of fentanyl is it wears off a little bit quicker because it has a short half-life. Um, the other one that we like to get, and the reason we like to give this one, is because it has less side effects than a lot of the other opioids is morphine. So morphine and fentanyl are two big drugs that we give. We never give Dilaudid in pediatrics or very, very rarely. Um, if they did, it would probably be an older kid, like a teenager. Make sure y'all don't have any questions. Cool. Let's keep going. All right. The most important in establishing trusting relationships with the adolescent population. Um, this is important with school age to a point. Um, this is important with adults too, but privacy and confidentiality are huge with adolescents. They are coming into figuring out so much about their bodies, about their sexuality, about their identities, everything, that privacy and confidentiality is huge for them. So they need to know that they can trust you. Just don't make sure you, you state a confidential confidentiality if you can't maintain that. For instance, if you, um, if you tell them that you won't tell anybody no matter what and they tell you something you have to share with somebody else, um, making sure you tell them who you can and can't share it with, things like that. These three factors are the most important in determining method of transportation for a child. And this goes for an adult as well. Um, not, not one of them, but a couple of the others do. Um, but we need to go by age. Like, for instance, if they're an infant, we're not going to put them in a wheelchair. Um, level of consciousness. If they are lethargic uh, or can't sit up, again, we're not going to put them in a wheelchair. We'll put them in a stretcher. And how far they're being taken. Um, if you are taking them downstairs, for instance, you might not want to push them in a bassinet versus we might use a bassinet if you're just taking them to mom's room, things like that. All right, so this is one we had. Well, you I, you haven't had the lecture on yet, um, but again, I will have that neuro and neuromuscular and musculoskeletal lecture by tomorrow at the latest. Promise. Um, but let's see if you know this one. So jerking muscle movements with stimulation. This is characteristic of spastic cerebral palsy, specifically spastic cerebral palsy. So there are four different categories. Cerebral palsy is where you have some injury to the brain, typically some kind of a noxic brain injury where there was a lack of oxygen. And because of this, they have, um, they have injury to the the tissue, the muscle of the brain. Um, so one of the types they get is called spastic cerebral palsy. And what this is, is exactly what it says. They get jerking movements with stimulation. So at rest, they're just laying there um, calmly. If they are stimulated, whether it be you talk to them or you touch them, um, this can um, create spastic movements. Um, in like jerking movements. So which medication do we use to treat spasticity? Um, hopefully this is a drug you learned about in pharmacology. It's baclofen. Um, we use this in children as well as adults. Um, and this helps with those spastic movements. It kind of calms those muscles down so they can relax. It decreases that sen sensory um, stimulation going to the muscles to thereby decrease the spastic movements related to the overstimulation of the sensation. Just checking. Perfect. We'll keep going. All right. Often the first sign of hearing impairment in an infant. So we didn't specifically talk about this as being a part of hearing impairment, I don't think, um, when we talked about infants. But we did talk about the Morrow sign. So that startle reflex 
that infants have um, where they fan their arms out um, with stimulation. If they don't have that Morrow reflex where they don't, you, you clap by their ear and they don't have that startle, that could be a sign of hearing impairment. Um, in an older infant or a toddler, a lot of times the first sign is lack of speech development. So whenever children have speech disorders, the first thing they're going to look at is um, hearing evaluations. Um, and going back to that, the most common cause of hearing impairment, especially acquired hearing impairment that happens later, is repetitive ear infections. That's why they're so on top of treating ear infections in the under two population um, is because that's when those language skills are developing. And if they get a bunch of ear infections, they can develop scar tissue and hearing impairment, um, which can lead to impaired speech development. All right, so this assessment finding is considered a neurosurgical emergency because it is a sign of a brainstem her herniation. So again, you haven't had this yet, um, but just to cover this, um, a fixed and dilated or blown pupil is a neurosurgical emergency. And what is happening with this, um, with increased intracranial pressure, or increased pressure in the head from on the, on the brain tissue, um, it the tissue has to go somewhere. Um, your skull is a fixed cavity um, and it can't expand as that tissue is expanding or there's a brain bleed. So it causes pressure, almost like compartment syndrome um, on your brain. Um, and the tissue is finally going to go somewhere. So it's going to start to push out the back of that occipital opening. Um, and one of the signs you see is where you'll have a fixed and dilated pupil or you'll, you'll hear it called a blown pupil. And this is typically on one side or the other. It's it's not usually bilateral. You have one pupil that is dilated, it's very large, um, and it does not constrict with stimulation like you would expect it to when you shine the light on it. Okay, just want to make sure. All right, vomiting, lethargy, high-pitched cry, bulging fontanel, fever, are often signs of this in an infant. So as you listen to your lecture tomorrow on the neuro neurological stuff, um, you'll find these are, most of these are symptoms of a lot of things. Um, vomiting, lethargy, high-pitched cry, bulging fontanelle, those four are, can be associated with head injuries. They can be associated with a lot of different things. But the fever is what makes this different. This can be meningitis. Um, another um, symptom that you may see that is hallmark to meningitis, um, especially in older children, is what we call nuchal rigidity, spelled N-U-C-H-A-L, nuchal, meaning neck. Um, so they, they have problems bending their, their heads forward to their chin to their chest. Um, so in an older child, you'll see sensitivity to light sound, your photophobia, phonophobia, headache. Again, that nuchal rigidity, it's spelled right there. Um, so make sure you understand the differences in infant symptoms and older child symptoms. Now, older children can also have the vomiting and the lethargy, but they're not going to have the high-pitched cry or the bulging fontanelle. Just like an infant's not going to have a headache or sensitivity to light because an infant can't tell you that they have a headache. So nursing care parameters, the biggest thing we're focused on is putting them on precautions. When the aid come in, your priority with bacterial meningitis is to put them on droplet precautions. And the reason for this is you need to prevent um, it moving to other populations. We're seeing that right now with all the coronavirus stuff is people should um, be isolated as soon as possible, even at a potential um, infection. So droplet precautions, and that's with any infectious disease, not just meningitis. If you get priority questions on NCLEX about um, a patient, if it's an infectious disease thing and it asks you priorities, it is going to be, if there's a isolation precautions on there, it's going to be that. Another precaution we put these patients on is seizure precautions. It's not saying every patient 
um, develops seizures that has uh, meningitis, but it is a potential as the, the pressure inside their head and the infection increases. Um, seizure precautions, just basically making sure that the side rails are padded and things like that. Um, monitoring, so oftentimes these patients will be on at least every two hour neurological monitoring and vital sign monitoring, um, strict eyes and O's, things like that. Um, another big intervention with patients, and neuro patients in general, is decreased stimulation. So turning down the lights, um, making sure their head is at least 30 degrees. You don't want them laying flat um, because that increases pressure on that head. Anything that decreases stimulation in these patients that um, could um, aggravate their, their swelling and their pain. All right. Covering one eye or tilting the head to read may be symptoms of these vision disorders. So haven't talked about this yet. This will be on your recorded lecture. Um, so this is strabismus and amblyopia. So strabismus and amblyopia are where you have one eye. Strabismus is where you have one eye that kind of wanders over to the side. Um, somebody who's cross-eyed would be an example if they have bilateral strabismus. Um, whereas amblyopia is where you have one eye where the acuity of the visual acuity is much worse than um, the other eye. Um, sometimes strabismus can cause amblyopia. If you have an eye that just kind of wanders around because the muscles aren't strong enough to maintain that eye in place, that can then cause the acuity to be decreased in the eye. But the treatment for them is the same. The initial treatment is to patch up the good eye, cover the good eye so it makes the impaired eye work harder. Um, a lot of people this works for. If it doesn't work, um, they can always, their surgical methods, especially with strabismus, they can go in and, and do surgical repairs on those muscles because that, that's a muscle problem. Um, but patching the good eye often helps with these patients. All right, let me make sure y'all don't have any questions. No questions? All right. We will keep going. Where's my icon? There it is. All right. Two best preventative measures for Rye syndrome. So there are two important key things related to Rye syndrome. So Rye syndrome is the one that we teach parents don't give aspirin or salicylates to any child who has an acute infection. Um, the other part of that is the it's not necessarily always an acute infection, but it's associated with when they have influenza or varicella. Um, so the two big key things is avoiding salicylates or aspirin, but also vaccinations against varicella and influenza. And now that these vaccinations are more readily available and we're also educating the public more and more about not giving aspirin to children, Rye syndrome is very, very rare. So education's working. Um, those are the best ways to avoid those complications um, or, or avoid Rye syndrome is avoiding salicylates. And then... It, making sure those children get those vaccinations can help as well. Three components of the Glasgow Coma Scale. So the Glasgow Coma Scale is a more objective way for us to assess their neurological functioning. You need to know the three components of the Glasgow Coma Scale. I'm not saying that you have to memorize how to evaluate that Glasgow Coma Scale um, as in a patient scenario and you have to analyze what their score would be, but you should know the three things we're assessing. So we are assessing eye opening, verbal response, and motor response. The GCS or Glasgow Coma Scale goes up to 15 is the, t the highest you can be. If you're completely alert and oriented, you'd be a 15. Um, the lowest you can get is three. So somebody that's completely unconscious um, and unaware would be that three. Um, so no, and if you, if, you introduce yourself to somebody and ask them their name or whatnot and they are looking at you and they respond to you well there's your three areas right there that they're fully awake and oriented um so make sure you know those three components that we're assessing in that glasgow coma scale this type of generalized seizure is associated with staring episodes. So there's two main types of seizures, generalized seizures. You can have partial seizures where it's only a little portion of the brain and they can have various things like a tick or a twitch of uh, an extremity or things like that. But the generalized seizures, one is called tonic-clonic seizures. And that's what most people think of when they think of 
um, seizures. That is the jerking rhythmic movements that you see, um, and they are unresponsive. The other type, which is the type that is associated with staring episodes, is called absent seizures. You'll also hear it called pettit mall seizures, kind of an old terminology. We don't use that one as much, but you may hear that term. So absent seizures is exactly that. They have periods of just staring off. They'll stare off for five seconds or so, ten seconds, and then they're right back at it. It's easy to misdiagnose um, because teachers will just report that they're not paying attention in class or, or daydreaming or things like that, and it's actually a seizure um, because they happen so quickly um, they can be easily missed. All right. Primary nursing concern in a patient having a seizure. What is your priority when they are having a seizure at that time? And that is safety. Um, so when we're talking about patients that are having seizures, safety is our priority. Um, hopefully by now y'all know what to do in a seizure. You turn them on your side, on their side. Um, you don't put anything in the mouth. You don't restrain them. Things like that. You want to you want to keep them safe. Moving things out of the way that um, they could hit themselves on, or, or um, putting something under their head so they don't bash their head on the floor. Safety is your priority. All right, the appropriate put pin up placement of a patient over the age of three is up and back. Um, so think of up is for bigger people, and then under the age of three, down and back. So up or down is the biggest difference you want to know about that. So we use this not only when we're assessing the ears so we can get a better visual of the canal, but we'll use this also to administer um, otic drops, for instance. All right. Let's see your math. All right. Let's take us back to body surface area. I know it's been a little while um, since we did this for your dosage calculation, but go back and use that sheet, um, the practice questions I gave you at the beginning, um, to help remind you of how to complete these because we're in pediatrics again, so this will be coming on back. So in this instance, your patient weighs 22 pounds, and they are 50 centimeters tall. The patient is ordered to receive 40 milligrams per meter squared of medication. What is your patient dose in milligrams? So I'm going to give y'all just a couple seconds. I want y'all to figure that out. I'm going to switch over, see if any of y'all have questions. Airway, good job, which airway is part of that safety. Um, you want to make sure, I know you're talking about the question with um, the seizures, what's your priority? Um, so airway kind of falls in that. So safety in airway, um, airway in the sense of protecting that airway, turning them on their side. Um, absolutely, airway is super important. Let me pull this back over. So you can see it again in case y'all don't know what it says. I'll give y'all just a minute or so so you can read it. Um, try and I want you to try and figure it out on your own first. Um, and then, of course, I'll go through it. All righty. So let's talk about our dose. So our first step. First thing we got to do is convert that weight. Our weight is in pounds. Um, Y'all know this part. I made it a nice round even number so that it comes out to 10 kilos. It doesn't always come out that way, but this time it did. So then after that, we take our kilograms, our weight, multiply by our height in centimeters, so 10 kilos times 50 centimeters, divided by 3,600. We hit, and I put it here the way you enter it in our calculator. So 10 times 50 divided by 3,600. You hit equals, you would get that 0 0.1338. And I know if you're at home doing this on your phone, you might have to hit the square root ahead of time. So if you're doing it differently where you're doing square root first, that's okay. Um, this is just the way we do it on our calculators, just as a reminder. So you hit the square root at the end, and then you get 0 0.372 et cetera, et cetera, meters squared. So that is your body surface area. Once you get your body surface area, how big the child is, then you multiply that by whatever your dose is. In this case, we're given 40 milligrams per meter squared. Um, so that gives us 14.907, et cetera, milligrams, which if we round to the whole number, I know it didn't say in the problem what to round to, um, but if, let's say it said round to the whole number, that would give us 15 milligrams. All right, let me 
me close that one. All right. Before I switch to the other one, is there any questions y'all have? Anything you want me to go back over? Any of them I kind of flew through that you want me to, to talk about again? Um, anything at all? And of course, I try to keep flipping back and forth so that I can see your comments <laughs> before I get too far away. Good question, Renivia. So um, after you hit the square root, um, that will give you your body surface area answer. Um, but your body surface area is not what you're going to be looking for. It's going to be your dose. So that is the answer. Let me pull that back up just so I can use that as an example while I'm explaining it. Um, so the body surface area wouldn't be your end answer in regards to what you're actually looking for to put on your Scantron. Um, but it would be your answer as far as... Um, what you would put, uh, what your body surface area is, and what you would use to multiply your, um, where is it? There it is. Um, what you would use to, well, shoot, multiply your, your numbers by. So when we do that, we, we convert it. So this is when we do the body surface area, yes, that square root is your last thing you're putting as far as figuring out that body surface area right here. Um, so once you hit that square root, you don't have to hit the equals again. I just put it there to show it equals. But when you do 10 times 50 divided by 3600, you do have to hit equals after the 3600 or it will just take part of the square root then hit the square root, you don't have to hit equals again, and that will give you that 0 0.37, et cetera, number. Now that number is only your measurement of your patient. This is not your dose. So you still have to take the measurement of your patient, just like if you were doing weight-based dosing, and multiply by whatever that dose is, in this case, 40 milligrams. Does that make sense, how you need that extra step after you do the body surface area? Yes, awesome. I wanted to make sure y'all knew that. All right, is there anything else you want me to clarify on that first round? And then we can do um, the second one. And actually, I think I pulled up the wrong one. I did. Um, I was thinking when I got a flash of it, that didn't look right. This is what I want. Y'all, that's what I want. All right. Let me close that. All right. All right. If y'all have no other questions, I'm going to move to the second round. Um, and don't forget, if you miss something, this will be, I'm recording this right now. Um, so I will, I'm not quite sure how I'm going to post it. It might be where I email you um, the file for it. I, I might put it on Blackboard. I haven't gotten that far yet to see how I can do that um, but you will get it one way or another I'll figure out a way for y'all to get it alrighty let's do our second round and again I'm just gonna go through like I did the first one um, instead of um, instead of having y'all answer and I'll jump back and forth a little bit to see if y'all have any questions all right, so first one, providing a limited number of choices promotes this developmental stage in the toddler child. So our toddlers are in the, the autonomy versus shame and doubt stage. So they are trying to learn how to make their own choices and make their own decisions. Um, so promoting that autonomy and independence, we can do that by allowing them to be part of the process. And really this goes with any child after infancy. Um, you want them to be part of the process, part of making decisions when you can, of course. Um, 
And one way we can do that is to give them choices, but we don't want to give them an abundance of choices. If you give them five different choices of what they can have for lunch, by the time you get to the fifth one, they have forgotten what the first one is, and they are so overwhelmed, they're not going to be able to figure out, and they're just going to get confused and overwhelmed and, and upset. Um, so maybe two or maybe three choices, two or three, um, just something where they get to have a say in the process, but you're not overwhelming them with too many choices in there. The standard pattern of tooth eruption in an infant, how does this progress? So typically the first tooth pops out at six months. Um, and, and again, this is standard. I know in real children, a lot of times they may go a couple months with no teeth and then they pop three of them out at the same time. But the standard tooth eruption textbook wise um, typically begins at six months and then they'll have one tooth for each month after six months. So for example, let's say they're 10 months old, you would expect them to have four teeth because that, that's, that's four months past that six month age. Um, so typically begins at six months and then they get one for each month after that. If they were 12 months, you would expect them to have about six teeth, for example. All right, developing intimacy and identity as well as adjusting to rapid body changes are associated with which developmental group? So this, most people know this one. This one is your adolescent group. Um, so your adolescent group, this is identity versus role confusion. They're figuring out so many things about themselves. Um, sexual identity, profession identity, where they want to go to college, um, how they associate with their friends, how they associate with their parents. They're, they're adjusting to all of those things. Um, and in, in addition, to that they're, they're going through puberty so there's lots of body changes that are confusing um, and often embarrassing and and it, it's a tough time so this is um, what is associated with this group the expected growth and weight of an infant during the first year so I know most people know this one too it's been ingrained in your brain and I'm glad because you need to know it um, so typically infants will double their birth weight at six months and triple their birth weight at one year so this is a good way um, when somebody asks me um, my my six month old baby weighs 12 pounds is that normal well, first you got to find out, well, what did they weigh at birth? It could be normal. Uh, if they only weighed six pounds at birth, that could be normal. If they weighed eight pounds at birth, mm, that shows they're not growing very quickly. So um, double at six months, triple at a year is our growth progress in an infant. Let me just see if y'all have any questions. Yay, triple, good job. Y'all know this stuff. All right, improved separation, communication skills, and control of body functions are all goals at the end of this developmental level. So think about what happens in the preschool stage. Um, so if we're talking about the end of the preschool stage, typically by the end of that, they are potty trained. So they have those control of body functions. They're able to better put words together and talk about what um, how they're feeling. They also start to develop that improved separation. This is when a lot of children start going to preschool or um, even kindergarten. So they're, they're developing Developing that ability to separate from their parents. So those are some of the common findings at the end of your preschool stage. Best way to prevent osteomyelitis. So this is one of those things hopefully you've covered in med search. Um, as far as some of the musculoskeletal stuff I don't go into as detail um, like the fractures and all because a lot of it is just review for you. We'll, we'll kind of skim over it. Um, but some of it, you, a lot of it you've probably had. So the best way to prevent osteomyelitis, hand hygiene and good wound care. Um, so osteomyelitis is an infection of the bone. And any time you have a fracture in a bone and you have an opening in the skin above where that fracture is, um, it doesn't have to be where the bone is actually poking out of the skin. An open fracture is any time there's a break in the skin where that fracture is. Um, I'll give you an example. We used to see kids a lot at Kid Med um, that would come in where they slam their fingers in doors. Um, ouch. And they would, their fingernail might be falling off, which means they would have a laceration where that fingernail was coming off. But if we did an x-ray, we would also see a small fracture in 
the tip of their finger. So that would be considered an open fracture. And the reason I'm telling you this is open fractures have a high risk of osteomyelitis because it's a direct route from the outside to the inside. So good hand hygiene, making sure wounds that um, whatever wound is over that bone is kept very, very clean um, because that is the best way to prevent osteomyelitis. Because once you get osteomyelitis, it is very, very hard to treat. All right, long-term growth problems. The primary concern with this location of fracture. Um, so one of the few differences we talk about in pediatrics versus adults. Um, in adults, this is not a type of fracture you worried about because their bones have finished calcifying and growing. Um, but in children, they have what's called growth plates or epiphyseal plates, E-P-I-P-H-Y. S-E-A-L, epiphyseal plates. Um, so growth plates are the parts of the long bones that are still cartilaginous. They still have cartilage in them. And if there is a fracture along there, um, it creates a scar. And that scar tissue won't grow. Kind of like if you cut your skin, that scar tissue um, doesn't function the same way as un um, harm tissue does. So that can result in stunting of growth or uneven growth And when you're talking about something that's bilateral like your femurs for instance. So that's what we worry about in children with growth plate fractures. Some primary concerns in a patient with traction or in traction. Um, so not I'm not looking at specific types of traction like Buck's traction for instance where you need to know specifically to this type of traction what you do but in traction in general what are we concerned about? Um, so a skin assessment is a big thing so when they're in traction um, for a couple reasons typically they have are going to have pins embedded in their skin and into the bones so they have a direct route into that, that bone cause, potentially causing osteomyelitis. You also look at um, other skin areas. They, they can't turn. They, they need to stay in the same position all the time or relatively the same position. So they're more likely to possibly get pressure ulcers and things like that. That neurovascular assessment, I know you've talked about this in med surge, but make sure you know your five P's, assessing pain, pallor, paralysis, paresthesia and pulses distal to that injury to make sure that extremity or wherever it is is being perfused well. That infection assessment, again, with those pins being embedded, high risk of infection. And the biggest thing related to the traction itself, making sure those weights that are attached to the traction um, are able to hang freely because if there's any disruption in the weights, if something is put under them where they don't hang freely, you're not getting that prescribed amount of weight that's holding those bones in place while they heal. Great question, Rachel. So um, you're, are you talking about legs, calf, perth disease? I always have trouble with that word. Um, that is a, a genetic disorder. Um, so with leg, calf, perth disease, that's a genetic disorder where they have um, their bones are kind of bowed abnormally. Um, so no, that is not um, associated with that. That's more genetic. And, and I know that they, it talks about that in your um, in your ATI book um, in children, but that that's a genetic disorder is associated with um, this um, as far as traction and all. That is, um, or osteo are you talking about osteomyelitis or just traction in general? I see with the growth plate, yes. Um, so no, that is not um, the same thing. Great question. So the le again, the leg calf purse disease, um, you may see some similarities as far as how they present in the sense with a growth plate fracture, they'll have impaired growth. They may have bowing of the bone where the scar tissue is kind of like um, that leg calf purse disease, um, but um, this is genetic. Um, versus a growth plate fracture um, is where they've had some fracture of the bone and, and it doesn't heal correctly. Does that make sense? No problem. I know that's something you don't hear about the leg cast purse because it is, um, it's not super common, but you do hear of that disorder sometimes. All righty. 
Hopefully y'all know this one, even though you, you haven't had the lecture yet, most people know the answer to this question. So when you have the child bend forward at the waist with their hands together, hanging down, the best way to assess for what disorder. So all of you probably did this in middle school or have children that have done this. You have them put their hands in front of them um, about shoulder level and you have them bend over. So you're looking at the curvature of the spine, make sure there's no lateral curvature. Um, when they're standing straight up, you're looking at their hips to make sure they're equal. You're looking at their shoulders to make sure they're equal. Um, and this is where we're assessing for scoliosis. Yay! Look at y'all. Y'all so smart. Oh, y'all got that one. Yeah, most, most people know that one because um, you've most people have at least experienced the testing for it um, where we all did it in the girls locker room where you had to bend over and check the back. Um, you want to make sure that they don't have a, a shirt on when you're doing this because you really can't assess the hip level, the shoulder level, or even the curvature of the spine if they have clothing on. All right, the five P's. I already gave you this one, and hopefully you know it already anyway. Your pain, pulse, pallor, paralysis, and paresthesia. These are the five things you're assessing um, when you're determining perfusion status. So a lot of times you're not going through your head necessarily thinking about it, but when you're checking, say, cap refill, and you're looking at the collar, and you're checking their pedal pulse and things like that, you're looking to make sure there is perfusion distal to wherever their injury is to make sure they're not having compartment syndrome or something else that's cutting off blood flow. The best routine palpable pulse site for a child over the age of two. So I put palpable purposely because the other answer when you auscultate is pretty obvious. <laughs> um, but with palpation where you're actually feeling, so if they're over the age of two, you're going to feel that radial pulse just like an adult. If they're under the age of two, go back to your BLS class where you took um, ba your basic um, CPR. That is your brachial, so up in between um, the elbow and the shoulder, mid shaft of the arm. Um, so overall sight, the best overall sight under the age of the five and the best one that should be used is listening to that apical heart rate for a full minute. Um, because like we talked about in newborns, their heart rates can be irregular at baseline. Um, so we want to make sure we're getting that accurate heart rate. The method for determining an infant's adjusted developmental age for infants who were born preterm. We talked about this a little bit um, with newborns um, when we were talking about preterm babies. Um, but we're going to revisit this because this really does deal more with pediatrics. Um, so the best way is to adjust based on what age they should be if they were born full term. Um, so for example, when we're gauging growth and development, like that Denver screening we talked about, and we're looking to see if they're on track, uh, we don't want to use whatever their chronological age is because they, they should have still been in utero, so they're not going to be at their, their growth and developmental um, requirements at that age. So for example, let's say baby is six months old, but they were two months early, you're not going to gauge them as a six month old, even though that's their age, you're gonna gauge them as a four month old because that's how old they would have been if they had stayed full term in utero. So basically you're, you're subtracting however many months early they were um, to gauge what their 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 age should be or what their development should be. So this can provide assessment information of the child's relationships, provide a means of expression, provide sense of accomplishment, provide distraction, and can be done through many methods including art and video games. There's a whole lot of information in that question, but the reason I did that is I want to make sure you understand all the components of therapeutic play. Um, so therapeutic play is huge in pediatrics. Um, I do clinicals for the ADNs um, in pediatrics, and they always laugh at me when, when they're doing their evaluation sheets um, for the end of clinical, uh, just like you do for your clinical, and um, th they ask me what skills, do I have suggestions for skills, and I'm like, therapeutic play, and they laugh at me like I'm joking, but it, it is truly a skill we use in pediatric nursing. Um, we, we learn how to, that's part of why we, we focus on those growth and development stages. We don't necessarily um, look at what stages are in, but knowing how they're adapting in those stages, we can determine how best to play with them and things like that. So it allows us to assess um, relationships. It allows us to, to communicate with them. It, um, 
it's good for distracting. Um, and one thing I know video games gets a bad rep, um, but it even says in your ATI book, video games are not bad um, as long as they are nonviolent. Um, so don't think if something says video games as a form of play is necessarily wrong because it is not necessarily. This is common in younger children and describes the need for routine using the same objects, same circumstances, etc. You see this a lot in your toddlers and your preschoolers called ritualism. So ritualism is where they need, for instance, the same cup every time they um, have a meal or using the same blanket all the time or wearing the same dress every day for a month and won't let you wash it. So that ritualistic need um, is their way of coping and having control of their situation and very um, much a, a need for them. Um, you, when we talk about autism later on in, in the class, um, this is something you'll see with patients with autism past those younger children. So they'll continue to have that very rigid ritualistic need um, beyond those early years. But in the early years, like toddlers and preschoolers, um, that, that rigidity, that ritualism is very important to them to, to maintain um, the, their coping of their environment. All right, a good way to improve compliance in a child. Um, so a good way to improve compliance, this kind of goes with the uh, previous question, allowing them choices when you can. And again, don't give them a choice that's not a choice. Don't say, are you ready to go to bed? if it's not really an option, um, but ask them if they want to drink out of a cup or a syringe or what toy they want to hold while they take the medication or what they want to drink after they take the medication. Um, and again, allowing children to help um, with any decisions, not just medications, but let's say if they've got um, a fear of the dark, for instance, having them help pick out um, a lamp to have in their room to to alleviate their fears, things like that, getting them involved with the process of, um, uh, of finding coping mechanisms for their for themselves. The most important factor when determining toys and play activities for a child. So growth and development is important. Um, you want to make sure you are getting toys that are appropriate to that child based on not their chronological level, but their developmental level. If you have a five-year-old who has the cognitive ability of a two-year-old, you can't give them a puzzle or a board game like you might for a five-year-old because they're, it's not going to meet their needs. Um, growth and development is important, but the most important factor is safety. Um, so with safety, this includes making sure that there's no small parts they can swallow or parts that will break off that they either they can swallow or they can get cut by. Safety also goes with infection control. In the hospital, all the toys that are shared among patients have to be wipeable and have to be sterilized. They have to be like hard plastic toys. If you have things like stuffed animals or even books, those have to be one child only. Once that child has that, it either gets thrown away or it goes home with the child um, because there's no true way to sterilize those objects. Um, so safety is number one. And again, second most important factor adjusted to whatever their developmental age is so that they can get um, a benefit out of it. These would include appropriate safety, te safety teaching parameters for infants and toddlers. So things like rear-facing car seat until two years of age. All poisons need to be not just put up high, but locked away. Um, infant gates need to be not just at the top or the bottom, but both, because um, they can go either way. Um, Scatter rugs, just like we do in our geriatric patients, removing of any rugs or things that they can slip or trip on, um, covering electrical outlets, putting the covers on the corners of tables and things so they don't hurt themselves, removing poisonous plants. All these are factors um, to, perfect, to protect infants and toddlers because they are very, very curious. Most common cause of death in the adolescent population. We talked about this in class after our quiz. So motor vehicle accidents. So the most common cause of death in all pediatric patients is accidents. The type of accident is going to vary depending on the age of the child, um, uh, the, gr the gross stage of the child. But when we're talking about adolescents, it's motor vehicle accidents. Yay, Denise, motor vehicle accidents. Very good. 
Y'all got this. Y'all are going to do fabulous next week. I feel it. Some important parameters for infant nutrition. So some of this we did cover um, when we did newborns. Um, some of it is a little bit for older infants. Um, but we want to make sure if they are formula fed, they are mixing the formula as directed. Um, sometimes if they don't know how to mix it or um, women who um, are short on money and formula is expensive, they may dilute it more than it's supposed to be to help conserve money and that can cause seizures um, due to drops in sodium. So making sure they're mixing it as directed. Um, as we're talking about older infants, they should never mix cereal into formula. So sometimes you'll see where mamas learn it from their mamas to mix cereal and formula. Um, it makes the formula heavier. It makes it sit in the stomach a little bit longer so that um, it makes babies sleep longer sometimes. Um, the problem is it's also a choking hazard and it can also lead to obesity because it gives them a lot of unnecessary calories. Um, so cereals should not be mixed into formula unless, and again, when we get to GI, um, there will be some very specific instances I'll talk about where, um, like when they have reflux and under a doctor's direction, they're told to give um, cereal and formula. Um, but as an overall rule, we don't mix cereal and formula. Um, we want to give new foods before formula. So if they have a, a belly full of formula um, and you try to give them a new food, they're not going to take it. So it's good to give it to them when they're good hungry um, so they're more likely to try it and partake in it. Um, giving breast milk or formula until 12 months, they should not have any else for nutritive value except for one of those and there's different types of formula it can be cow's milk based formula which most standard formulas are cow's milk based it can be soy milk based formula it can be hypoallergenic it can be milk free there's various different ones but it needs to be some kind of infant approved formula or breast milk um, children should not have regular cow's milk goat milk soy milk any of that stuff until at least 12 months of age because they cannot digest it and it can lead to iron deficiency Efficiency anemia. Um, and one thing we did talk about with newborns is um, no water before six months. And that goes kind of back to the mixing formula as directed. You don't want them to get um, hyponatremia. Immunizations that cannot be given prior to 12 months of age. So back when we did pregnancy, I know that seems like a long time ago, um, we talked about pregnant women cannot get live vaccines. Well, guess what? Neither can infants or shouldn't. Um, so they should not get varicella and MMR. We talked about that. Now, hepatitis A is not a live vaccine. Um, but um, we don't give hepatitis A. So varicella, hepatitis A, MMR all start at 12 months of age. Under one year of age, there's a bunch. We give DTaP, hepatitis B, rotavirus, Hib, PCV. Those are some of the big ones. Um, a lot of times people ask, what's the difference in DTaP and TDAP? Um, they are not the same. So DTaP is with, that starts with a D is the one we give to infants. TDAP, like you have to get as an adult, is given to over the age of 10. They have the same components, tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussis, um, but they are different concentrations. So under the age of 10, when they're an infant, for instance, they get five doses of that DTAP. Um, but once you hit middle school, when they start getting those adult immunizations, then they'll give the TDAP. Um, make sure you know, um, I posted in your Blackboard a, a CDC immunization schedule. It's all also listed in your um, in your ATI book. Make sure you know um, an, an overview of your immunization schedule as well as how many vaccinations of each you get. Like for instance, five DTAPs and three hepatitis Bs and things like that. All right, the priority intervention in a patient who has an unexpected outcome, such as, and I think we get this on every Jeopardy because it is that important, and y'all always know the answer. Um, we stop whatever the cause is. So if you have an IV that's infiltrating, you turn it off. Um, if you are having a blood transfusion and they start having itching, you're going to turn off the blood transfusion. So stopping whatever is causing the adverse effect. Concrete and logical thinking, including cause and effect, as that's what I say as well as increased socialization and participation in group activities what developmental stage do we see this in so this stage is the school age so that concrete operation stage is when this starts um, 
and they start to be it. So make sure you understand what concrete operations is. So with concrete operations, they can start to understand, for example, like here, cause and effect. They understand that the reason they are punished is because they did this. Or, or they start to understand the reason they don't feel good is because they got strep. Um, concrete thinking has to deal with they know their letters, um, they know their numbers, they know sequencing of numbers. So uh, the, going back to the pain scale, this is where they start understanding that a pain of five is greater than a pain of three, for example. Um, they start to socialize more. This is when they start to get into sports. This is when they start to develop peer relationships. Um, so that is your, your school age child. Let's see. Yes. Very good, Rachel. So um, that video, I believe I posted that in your Blackboard, but I might not have. If I haven't, then I will go back and check, and I will post that. There is um, your Dr. Hip, uh, your Dr. Hip, and um, your B Dr. Hip. Um, the the B meaning the hepatitis B is the the different one. Um, so there's lots of different mnemonics out there that can help you. Um, and I know immunizations is a bear, and there is a lot to memorize. Um, and, and if, if you don't memorize every single one, it's okay, but you should definitely know a, a large portion of, of when they get them um, and when they do not. A registered nurse RN is a video that I have used on Blackboard, I mean Blackboard, listen to me, on YouTube, she has a video specifically on mnemonics related to immunizations, which is a good one, and I think that should be the one I posted in your Blackboard, but again, I'll check and make sure I actually put it there, because maybe by chance I, I thought I did and I didn't, um, but if I didn't, I will, um, but yes, using mnemonics for immunizations is a great way to to remember those, because they're, they're, there's a lot of them to remember. <laughs> All right. The moral development of this stage is based on wanting to please others. Praise and criticism are important at this time. Again, this is your school age child. So um, your, your big moral development in your toddlers and your preschoolers is more about punishment. So that's why, for instance, spankings work well in your toddlers and preschoolers because that, that punishment that's associated with it. But as you get into the school age group, um, they're more associated with <clears throat> the, the pointing to please, especially their parents. Good job, you did so great. Like really going over the top to, to really lavish onto them how proud you are of them, for instance, really impacts the school age child and does well for them. This describes the disorder in which there is an alteration in the production or absorption of CSF. I know you haven't listened to the neuro lecture yet. However, this is something we covered in newborns a little bit. We kind of glossed over it a little bit, and that is your hydrocephalus, where there is a blockage um, potentially to the ventricles. It's not allowing the ventricles to drain as they need to, um, which causes buildup of fluid in the brain and pressure, and we can put in a a shunt um, or a tube that drains from the ventricles into the peritoneal space to allow that fluid to drain. All right, a common concern of adolescent patients not seen in other developmental groups. So we talked about this last week. So concerns you see in every population or every growth and developmental stage, things like pain, separation, and body intrusion. The one that adolescents worry about that you don't see as much or don't really see at all in the other developmental groups is scarring, um, body image disturbances, things like that. So a lot of times in their head, how severe a situation is is more related to the amount of body image changes they have, not as much to how sick they actually are. Um, so, and I already talked about the other part, what is seen as concerns with other ones as well. So pain, um, body intrusion, modesty, you start to see that even in as young as preschoolers. Um, and then separation anxiety, again, we see that in every group, um, even in adolescents. So your math. Um, so hopefully you know how to do this one. This goes back to um, your, your desired over half um, and volume over time, except in this case, we don't even need to know um, 
the dose of the medicine. So if you go to the last question, what will be the rate of infusion in milliliters per hour? Um, so we know we need a volume and we know we need a time. Um, so the patient is ordered to receive a thousand milligrams. That's not a volume or a time. Um, medication is diluted in 500 mLs. Well, that's our volume. It already gives us our volume. We don't have to figure out what our volume is. And we're giving it over 90 minutes. So there's our time. So to figure that out, you put your 500 mLs, your volume over your 1.5 hours and if you were rounding to the whole number you get 333 mls per hour all righty which question don't you see bemnet what do you mean Oh, did it did it close? That's wait a minute. I think it shot it stopped sharing my it did. It stopped sharing my desktop. Let me bring it back up. I'm so sorry. Um I don't know what happened. <laughs> Let's try that again. It's going to I knew it was going to do that. All righty. <laughs> So let's try this again, and hopefully you can see it this time. The patient is ordered to receive 1,000 milligrams of a med. This medication is diluted in 500 mLs, and it's given over 90 minutes. Um, what will be the rate of infusion in mLs per hour? So hopefully this will make more sense now that you can actually see it. Um, so in this case, if we're looking for mLs per hour, we just need volume and we just need time. So it's diluted in 500 ml, so it already gives us the volume, um, and then it gives us the time as well. So if we do our 500 mLs over our 1.5 hours, um, which is our time when we convert it to hours, our rate would be 333 milliliters per hour. Oops, sorry about that. Were y'all able to see it that time when I just pulled it up? I just want to make sure. Okay, perfect. Wonderful. Okay, so I am going to let y'all go. Um, I went a little over my time. Um, hopefully you don't mind. Um, so next week, um, and I'll, I'll post a reminder email. We will meet in our usual classroom. Um, y'all are a small enough group. We don't have to make accommodations to be uh, basically our accommodations we have to be at least six feet apart so um, we can totally do that in y'all's classroom so go to room 201 like you normally do um, same time we'll still meet at 530 exam will still start at 530 that part won't change um, you'll only need to come on campus as of right now let me just say that as of right now on campus will be based on current situation. Things could change as early as tomorrow, um, but make sure you're there at 5.30 so we can take our exam. Same thing applies to always. Um, I hope this was helpful. Again, I did record this, um, and I'm going to find a way to make sure it gets posted somewhere, either by sending it to you through email, or if I can post it on Blackboard, I will figure that out, but I will make sure it gets to you. Is there anything I can answer before I hang up with y'all? Uh-oh, I think it stopped. Awesome. Absolutely. Anytime, um, if y'all need to... Um, Obviously, I'm always available by email, um, but if there's, say, for this instance, if there is something you want to talk to me where you want to see me, um, see my face, and you want something that's more than just a an email message, um, send me either a Skype request, you know, just like I sent to you, I sent it to you as a message, as an appointment. Um, if you don't know how to do that, send me an email, say, hey, I want to Skype with you. Um, can you send me a request? And I can send you that request as well if you want something a little more detailed than just um, an email thread. Um, and, and I can either have a personal Skype with you or we can do um, a group. I can send it out to everybody if they want to have that conversation. So um, I know this is a little unusual, but feel free to reach out to me. Um, Y'all have a good night, and I will see you next Wednesday.